It's a, a real pleasure to be here. We're, we're, we're going to talk today a little bit about women in leadership. Now, m- most companies recognize that diverse executive teams drive more innovation and better business outcomes. And as a result, they've been investing a lot more in DEI initiatives over the last few years. And the good news is we've no longer got a women in business problem. 47% of the workforce now across the top 3,000 companies in the United States is female. But we do have a women in leadership problem. Only one in four executive leaders is female. Just 12% of PL roles are filled by women, and fewer than 6% of those 3,000 companies are led by a female CEO. So today we're going to get a little into why that's the case and discuss some of the barriers holding women back. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today with Lorraine Tuhill, Google's chief marketing officer. Lorraine's been with Google since 2003 and manages a global team responsible for telling the story of Google's brand, driving revenue growth, and helping billions of users discover and make the most of Google products every day. Lorraine's been closely involved in Google's social impact focus on education, on economic opportunity, and and inclusion. Among other things, she's been named Adweek's grand brand genius, Business Insider's most innovative CMO, one of the 50 most powerful moms, and can Creative Marketer of the Year, as well as having spoken at the UN on empowering women through digital tools. So Lorraine, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Thanks, John, and thanks, Team P&G. It's an honor to be here with all of you and on such an important topic, especially. So maybe you can just start us off by sharing a little bit about your journey as a woman in the workplace and, and some of the things that you've learned along the way. For sure. Well, as you mentioned, I've been 18 years at Google, but I've been I've been really in two industries all my career. I've been in advertising and marketing. I'm a proud marketer. I've been in marketing for 28 years, and of which 21 years were in tech, two, two dot com consumer startups before Google. And I've worked in Europe and the US. And so like throughout all of that journey, there's definitely been a lot that that uh, I've learned. Both of those industries, by the way, are very male dominated, both advertising and tech, both of them. So I feel at the intersection of two very male industries my entire career, um, and, I've, and, I've, and I've learned a lot. Certainly in the earlier days, I learned a lot about resilience. <laughs> you had to, and I read that in your research and it really resonated with me, um, especially as I started to hit you know, middle management. And I remember being in a, in a, in a, in a dot-com startup that was well-funded, pretty big company in Europe and in, in the UK before I joined Google, very male management team. I was, it was my first time as a CMO, I was young for it, I was female, and I really felt excluded a lot of the time. Um, the guys would go to the bar after work, the guys would go play golf, the guys would have meetings without me, and I had to work really, really hard to fight my way in, and that's really what I learned about uh, resilience. But I think you know, joining Google, um, probably six years into Google, was one of my biggest lessons, which was um, you know, I built out marketing in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, very successful, had a great six years in Europe, um, they were looking for a global CMO, and I did not put my hand up, even though I had the biggest team and was very well respected and regarded and well known in the company because it was a lot smaller then. And um, it took it took it took three male advocates, you know, it took three sponsors to actually sit me down and say, "This is your job. You should be doing this. There is nobody out there more qualified than you. You would you would do this so well. Why aren't you putting your hand up?" And then I had to say to them, you know, very quietly, "Well." I'm actually, you know, I think I'm pregnant, but it's very early days, way before I should be telling anybody, by the way. But that's that's one of the main reasons. And they immediately said, well, congratulations. And we don't care in the least. We don't care. So I so I moved to the U.S., um, you know, and then get to the U.S., start to hire and build my team. And then six months later, go on maternity leave, you know, and everyone was so supportive. But I would never have I would never put myself forward and been in this extraordinary job that I've been in for the last 12 years if it hadn't been for our CEO at the time and you know a few others who knew me well, all guys sitting down and saying, you know, you need to go do this. What is stopping you and having that conversation with me? And so since then I've been very focused on making sure other women put their hands up, feel confident, self-advocate, and really help them prepare for those next steps, which really leads to the next big thing I learned, which because is, is that I spent so much of my career focused on helping women. When I moved to the US, you know, four or five years into my 12 year US journey, I realized I was so focused on women, I was excluding others. And that there's extraordinary diversity within diversity. So, it, you know, I needed to make sure I was lifting up African American women, um, Hispanic women, African American men, my trans community, and focused on 
really understanding all the nuances and intersectionality of diversity as I helped others, which is also a very big learning for me as a non-American coming from Europe, where I wasn't fluent in the racial challenges of the US. And I really needed to learn that, which taught me another new lesson, which was vulnerability. Being honest with my team, when they put their hands up and said, listen, you're not advocating for all of us, you're advocating for part of us. Which was, we've done great on that. We've got a lot more women, it's fantastic. But you're not advocating for all of us. I had to be honest and say, you know what, I'm not an expert in these issues. And saying that and saying, help me learn. I'm, gonna, I'm here to listen, help me learn. What should I read? Give me the books, uh, teach me. I just became a far more useful advocate for them and really understood all of these complexities and nuances much, much better. So long answer, but those are some of the big chapters in my life and some of the big learnings I've had on this journey. Maybe we can just pick up the rain a little bit on that intersectionality point, because yeah. you've, you, you've talked about that a lot in the past and feeling a responsibility yeah. to represent people across all of those um, dimensions. But I, I've also heard you in the past talk about and say very clearly, good intentions aren't, aren't enough. We need real concrete plans. Can you talk a little bit about some of the, the specific things you've done to help accelerate that progress and really, really affect real and, and sustainable change? For sure. And by the way, I think there are a lot of good intentions out there, which is why I always say that. I do think people have good intentions today. I think that's one of the biggest changes we've seen. People do care. Uh, really now it's about giving them the toolkit they need to make a difference and helping um, drive progress, actionable, accountable progress. So I think uh, you know the, the plan that we have is, is, is three parts to it. There's leaders accountable for change, a team that looks like its users, and work that challenges the status quo. The work part is mainly for the marketing team, my, my world, because we put the work out in the world, but think of products that change the challenge status quo, if you look all, all across Google or any company. On that first, first bucket, you need to have accountable programs to, to really um, help leaders understand how important this is, that it's core work, it's not nice to have, it's not work you do in your spare time, it's not work that you should feel like, you know, you've got to squeeze in, it is a core part of every leader's job. And to do that, you have to um, train them up, so that they have the tools they need to be able to do this. We have mandatory training uh, uh, for our manager, all of our managers on this. Um, they, you then have to be transparent with them, give them the data they need. Very, very, you know, we, we publish every two weeks, here's your data, your hiring, your promo rates by race and gender, your attrition rates, your retention rates, your satisfaction scores. They see this data and they're held accountable to it. Um, it has to affect the promo chances, it has to affect the ratings in the company. And so until you have those kind of, you know, that, that kind of that, that kind of system built in, it's extremely hard to drive major change. That starts to, to, to drive change. That's leaders. Um, for a team, it looks like it's users. You know, we at Google build products for the whole world. There's no way we can build products or great marketing campaigns for the whole world unless our teams look like the whole world. Like it's just, it's just, it's not, it's not, it's it's pretty straightforward, right? So um, now, to get there, and it's a big journey for us, and we're not there, we are on our way, you, you have to do a lot of, uh, uh, you've got to solve a lot of problems. We have a big issue on access. There are just not enough female engineering graduates in the U.S. or anywhere in the world. And so we work an awful lot, you know, with high school and university students to get more women and more, you know, racial minorities into schools studying computer science to me so that we can hire more graduates from diverse backgrounds and then have far more diversity building the world's technology products. That is a real a real, real issue. Um, I would consider that to be a burning issue when we're working really hard on that. Um, in, my, in my world, you know, we were hiring, I think all across Google, we were doing a good job on hiring from all different um, minority backgrounds. We were so focused on hiring and we were making so much progress there. We were not focused on building a community. We were not focused on our retention metrics. So we had a leaky bucket. And um, it's because we were hiring folks, we weren't onboarding them well, holding their hands as they land into this whole new culture, uh, giving them sponsors from day one, not just at senior levels, but all of them, giving them an onboarding body, giving them a mentor from day one, helping them set up for success in those first six months. We learned those first six months are critical. Um, checking in to make sure they're working on work, the kind of work they want to do, um, making sure that our promo, promotion rates across groups are accurate and where they should be and, and no groups being left behind, making sure we have clear advancement, advancement programs in place for all of the, our different minority communities so that they are putting their hands up for roles and just actively making sure that our promotion scores and our rating scores are equitable across all groups. 
So that 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 work in turn is a hard work that's ongoing to make sure that once we hire amazing people, no matter what their background is, they can thrive in our company and they can be successful and stay with us for the long haul. And I think that's where we probably learned the most. And then the last book, it really is for more for my world, which is Work That Challenges the Status Quo. We audit all of our creative work. We've audited 12, 000, 20 thousand pieces in the last three years alone um, to understand how much we are representing the multicultural world we live in in the work we put out in the world. I care, de I care deeply about this because I want my kids, one's a boy and one's a girl, I want them to see the world that I want them to live in, right? I want them to see in our ads and all the ads see on TV, the, the kind of world that it is the multicultural world we live in. I think P&G do, do this extremely well. Uh, you know, I think everybody, every single leader in every company should watch Sorry Not Sorry, the Pantene ad, I, you know, because it is exactly what we all experience in, in, in work. But um, I care deeply about getting the work right because that's something that I have ownership over. And so I, I want to be proud of the work that my team puts out, out in the world. And I know if I hire people from different diverse backgrounds and they thrive, they'll, be, they'll create amazing work that the world wants to see. And they'll stay with me and be proud of this work if we let them do, do their thing. So that, that last part's really important. Anyhow, I, there's, I, a lot, there's a lot, but you know, we've learned a lot about what, what makes a difference. No, I love that framework, Lorraine, and the sponsorship, the community, the the data all really resonates very, very powerfully. You mentioned on the the leadership and some of the the tracking and holding people to to account. Can you say a little bit more about how you how you think about that within Google and holding leaders to to account to continuing to deliver on on that program? Well, I think the first step was transparency. So as a company, we've been transparent publicly and publishing our annual diversity report for many, many years now. I think we were one of the first to do it. And that that's really, you know, making your, yourself very vulnerable and, and really publishing out your data, which, of course, is far from perfect. But then every year showing the progress against that. By doing that, it made us accountable as a company internally and externally. Every employee now sees that. The whole world sees that. So we can't publish the report next year and show no progress. So that was a very meaningful first step because once it's when, once it's published, you are then accountable, and so that was very effective. Staffing up internally teams who fully own this, I think, is really important. It was everybody's five percent job, you know, in the early days. Having dedicated teams, you know, within people ops who work across all the teams, making sure every team has a proper plan in place, that was an investment we needed to make to get to get that right, and that was really important work. So I think that's the first step. Transparency internally, then giving every leader their data pack very regularly and showing them we we lead great people in red, yellow, red, yellow, green against targets of like how are they how are they doing across all their 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 metrics and how how is their organization looking um, versus average, right? And just just showing them and helping them and holding them accountable to their data. I do think you have to build it in then to how your company runs. So in our company. You know your your six monthly ratings really matter. In our company, people are very you know are very excited about potentially getting promoted someday. These are tools you have to use. Uh, your six monthly rating affects your comp. So being able to use those kinds of um, levers to help leaders understand that this is actually a core part of their jobs. So for example, um, to get your six monthly score, John, your directs all have to answer some questions about you. One of those questions is about your inclusiveness as a leader, right? And that affects your score, right? And so that matters. Um, if you're a senior leader at Google, which is VP up, you know, your directs have to actually answer some very, very precise questions about what you've done as a leader to support our progress here. And certainly um, every manager in the company, in my team and across many teams in the company, writes in the tool their contribution towards our efforts. And I think that, and again, we're halfway built on that, I would say. But mm -hmm. it's a lot of it is progress and we're learning a lot. But those are some of the things that I think make a real difference because it has to feel part of the company's systems, part of how you run the company, part of the company's tools. It can't be a special project or a special exercise or something on top. And until it's part of the company's tools, systems, data packs, reporting, uh, you, you, you really won't um, have leaders put the time on this that it takes. And it does take time. It's not a this is this is this is proper or serious effort. And ongoing on an ongoing basis, it 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 does take time. And, and, and to that point, I, I guess I mean, it takes time. And and I know you've talked in the past about this being forever work, right? And the data and the transparency gives you a, a sense of the 
the progress being made every every six months. But what, what does success look like in that context? Um, I think success looks like um, people want to come work in our company. Um, where it's, I, I think these communities are small. I've been told this so many times by African-Americans in my team or uh, Hispanic leaders in my team. These communities are small. You know each other. Where it gets out, you either a place where it's a good place to go work, where they're going to thrive, or you're not, especially at the more senior levels where they're getting phone calls from everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So where it gets out. So number one, being able to hire great talent, world-class talent, and being able to retain that talent is the output. That's that To me, that's a, a major, major, major output, and that's how you measure this. And then happiness of that talent. Are they happy? Um, versus other groups in the company, versus the company average, and how are they feeling about the company? Um, do they feel heard? Do they feel listened to? Can they show up to work as their true selves? Um, I think that's really important. We learned a lot, um, you know, last year, for example, through um, the racial equity protests, where, you know, up till then, and this is something that my, many folks in my team said to me, look, I'm from the African-American community, for example, something terrible has happened to my community, and people are coming into work like it's a normal day. And I'm devastated inside, and I'm expected to show up and sit in all these meetings. And so we learned, we learned, we learned a big lesson from that. That we have to turn to folks and say, "Listen, if you need time, take time." You know, they were talking about the folks sitting around them, who were just unaware of what was happening in that person's world, and whether that was the Asian Americans who were really upset at stories where Asians were getting targeted through COVID, or whether that was African Americans seeing horrendous stories. It happens in all communities. Um, and we weren't really processing that internally at work, you know, and turning to folks and checking in and saying, hey, are you OK? Um, and so that 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 kind of that's less measurable, but it's the little things every day that we're now much better at doing and we've built into training so that folks understand that it's not just about the metrics and the numbers. It's about the lived experience of the folks in our team. Once you've hired them, once you've got them in great jobs, once you found them so that they feel proud to be here and they feel supported through those tougher times. Yeah, I guess it plays very much to your community point. And, and it's another, it's one piece of a, a much bigger puzzle on the leadership side, where now a lot of people talk about it being much harder to be a leader now than it was in the past. And I, I think that's always, at any point in time, it, it, it's like that. It, it's certainly different, right? Leaders now are expected to have a view on social issues in a way that wasn't the case five five years ago. When, when you think about leadership in Google and within your team, is there is there a shared view of what makes a, a great leader now? Well, I think that's the, that's, the, that's the great, that's the big question. I think there's no shared view anywhere of what makes a great leader, which is why I think you don't see more women getting into senior leadership roles, right? I think this is something that you covered in your research. So I think having a better shared view of what makes a great leader today would help all of us, I think would help everybody. Um, uh, and I really, I found that super interesting in the research you've done. But I think in our in our world, um, I do think leading with empathy, being a very human leader, is extremely important today, more than it ever was before. It probably likely was always important, but it's become really, I think, a leading uh, attribute today. I think women do that uniquely well, <laughs> to be honest. So I think that it, it, it's a time when you, I've definitely seen a lot of women shine whether that's through the complexities of, of the racial issues that we've dealt with in society or whether that's a pandemic and getting your teams and their families through a tough time with sick family members, sick friends in, and, you know, on carers leave and all of that. You know, I think it's a, it's a moment in time when empathy and, you know, being human and listening and being there for your team, being supportive and those softer skills that actually really matter when you're in charge of human beings and you're a leader of people. You know, they really shine right now. And I think that looking to the future, we're going to need a lot more of that. I have a lot of very young people in my organization. Um, that's what they look to in a leader. I think their definition of what a great leader looks like is very different to a more traditional definition of what a great leader looks like. And I really think that's that's where we're going. So I'm actually very excited by that. No, I think I completely agree with you. And I, I think there's a lot of really positive momentum. And, and maybe just learning a final question for you on that positive no, when you think about continuing this momentum and where where we go in the coming years, what's what's one thing you expect to happen in the next five years that may may shock or or, or wow folks uh, who, who are thinking about this? I don't know if I've any I've got any one thing. <laughs> Unfortunately, an awful lot of this work is 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 progress by inches. You know, there's no one silver bullet. 
But I, I do think that point I just mentioned about the younger generations, it makes us sound old, I know, but I have a lot of under 30s in my team, for example. And they just, their, their, their definition of gender, for example, is much more fluid. Their definition of race or what they see as race is much more fluid. Um, and they just all show up together. And um, the women are fierce. They are a force, right? Um, and um, they are brave and confident. Um, and there's far more diversity. And I just see them all, how these, the men go on paternity leave, which, by the way, I think is really important, really, really important. There's far more, I just think there's a lot of change happening. And um, will it change everything in the next five years? No, but I do think it, it's going to drive a lot of change over the next years. And I think we're seeing this sort of groundswell of the next generations and how they think about things. And it's very different. Yeah, I, well, I I share that optimism and certainly see that momentum and and hope we continue on that that path. Well, Lorraine, thank you very much for taking the time to share share your perspectives. Uh, Nikki, back to you.